Our um, next speaker, next speaker Jenny, Cole, Jenny Cole, CEO of Sports, Sports Australia. Australia. This Blurdy Sports, Sports Australia, Sports Australia, Sports Australia, Sports Australia, Sports Australia Sports Peak National Body, Body representing, Body Body representing Body athletes, athletes with disability. With disability. Based in Sydney, Based in South, South, Wales, South Wales, DSA, DSA, DSA Performance Role National Coordinating Body, body a single point of contact between partner organisation, partner organisation, organisation EG, ASC, ASC, ABC, 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 and state and state members, state members, state members, state members, state members, state members, state Jenny is passionate Jenny about, is passionate about sports, sports, sports from her beginnings from her as a, beginnings as a physio, 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 therapy student, student, student playing wheelchair, basketball, through a range of wheelchair, wheelchair, and, wheelchair and other sports, 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 and has a strong, has a strong, has, is a strong, is a strong supporter. Please welcome, please welcome. Please welcome. Thank you. Just done half, just done half. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Andrew. As I said at the beginning, I'm really excited, excited that we've that we've together this together. A really great, a really great collaboration. And I think, and I think um, the way that this is a way that this is together, together, is together, together, how we like to work. What I wanted to do is just give a little bit of a drive, a little bit of a little bit of an understanding of who we are as a national body, um, and then I'll chat a little bit about some of the ways that I see based on what Denise from Mount Hanford and others are about ideas and how we can be working together. And I think that the way that we are as a national body, and the way that we are as a national body, and the way that we are as a national body, we are Australian for body for athletes with disability. disability. In Australia, in Australia, we recognised by the Sports Commission, there are seven NSODs, National Sporting Organisations for Disabled. We are one, we just have 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 one, physical disability sport. We 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 provide a we range, provide of range of roles, a range of uh, services, services and services and We're a member-based member based organisation. We have a member organisation. We talk a little bit about, about. And we provide a range of different services and sometimes funding to help support the activities of our members and our partners um, across a range of areas. Um, we do fund programs for athletes. We also do coach accreditation and so on and so forth. I'll go through this in more detail later. Really, the guts of what we do is captured in this slide. Our aim, really, is to see more Australians with a disability being more active and engaged in a wider range of sport and active recreation. As a, a physio student at the tender age of 19, um, working in a spinal unit, I was taken out um, to play wheelchair basketball where we took patients from the spinal unit at Prince Henry out to play wheelchair basketball. At that point, I wasn't sure what I would do for a career, but from that moment, it was very clear. And, and I've spent the last 27 years mostly in voluntary roles, um, right from grassroots level, tra travelling with teams as physios, as helpers, right to um, international federation and Paralympic level roles. Because for me, this is it's the most exciting way as a physiotherapist um, that I can see to help change the lives of people who acquire a disability. And for those of you that do sport who have got a disability, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, I saw patients going through the spinal unit thinking that um, really life was over. You know, I'm an active guy, I did all these different things and suddenly what am I going to do? How am I going to, um, you know, get involved with sport? Can I drive? Can I do, you know, the kind of questions that come up. And when we took patients out to wheelchair basketball and they saw guys falling out of chairs and jumping back in and at one point I got knocked out of my chair, pinned to the ground and had my butt bitten in the middle of a basketball court <laughs> by a para. Um, so you're seeing people living full lives and being able to do those skills you learn, you know, you teach patients floor to chair transfers in the spinal unit and here are people just flicking back in and doing it. Um, you see people, I've seen people camping and climbing up into the backs of trucks and the way that that kind of um, activity changes people's perspective on themselves and other people's perspective and includes families. And for me, that's that that's that's so important. And I'm a bit passionate about this. But one of the things that always worried me was that um, there was wheelchair basketball. It was really well developed. But really, there weren't a lot of other opportunities. There's really one or two wheelchair sports that you could do or um, these were the offerings. There's this suite of offerings that you could do. <clears throat> But as an able-bodied person, I can do flamenco, I can do mountain, I could do mountain bike, I never have, but I could, I can ski, I think I've got all of these different range of choices that suit me personally. And one of the things that we're passionate about at Disability Sports Australia is where, as much as we can, partnering with others, increase the range of choices and opportunities that there are. So the adaptive mountain bike thing, when Andrew came to me with that, even though it's nothing to do with anything we've ever done before, 
what was exciting for me is that this is it's it's new, it's innovative, and it's a way that um, another option for people with a disability um, to be able to get out and experience active recreation and sport in a really unique way. And so that's why we were really keen to partner with that. Um, we want people to have a range of choices. Um, who are we talking about? Just to get a bit of a snapshot, and I use some of these stats. There's a range more, a lot more out there, but these stats I use to just kind of give people an idea of the scope of who we work with. In Australia, um, based on Australian Bureau of Statistics, there are more than one million people in Australia who have a physical disability with a moderate to severe activity limitation, which means that if you have a moderate to severe activity limitation, it's going to be hard for you to get involved in mainstream sport. Andrew showed you the inclusion spectrum. Um, you know, non-modified sports, slight modifications. Whether you have a moderate to severe activity limitations, you're starting to get into needing different equipment or um, an adaptive version of the sport, mostly. Um, so that's they're the group that we work with, and yet our member organisations in each state cater for 6,000 of those people, mainly wheelchair users. So for us, there's a big scope um, of people that are either not engaged or that we don't know about how they're engaged and we want to work more with all of them. Every 15 hours, a child's born with cerebral palsy in Australia. This is not a statistic that's <clears throat> decreasing. It's increasing because children are surviving things, um, uh, you know, they're surviving premature birth. They're surviving a whole bunch of things that happen in utero. In Australia, between 0 and 14 years of age, there's more than 150,000 kids with a physical disability or brain injury, with, and, and more than half of those have a moderate to severe activity limitation. We're talking about a lot of people here. And less than one third of these meet the recommended physical activity guidelines. Okay, so what we also know is from a range of different um, research papers is that between 85 and 95 percent of those people tested actually want to be more active, whether they're engaged or not. They either want to get involved or want to get more involved. So for us, it's a really clear message. There's a stack of people out there who want to do stuff, and we want to help them do stuff. I'm not going to go through too much on this. We have a few different roles. We're a peak body, obviously, but we're also the national sporting governing body responsible for wheelchair rugby, wheelchair Aussie rules football, which we've just launched this year, which we're super excited about. Um, wheelchair basketball, even though Basketball Australia look after the national team and national league, we still have responsibility for the sport at a, from an international perspective and our state member organisations are the ones that introduce people to the sport and provide the pathways through to state level and to national level. Um, lawn bowls, um, it's mainstreamed a bit in Victoria, but at a national level it's still us, power chair football, power chair hockey and a range of others that through our peak body um, responsibility, we have responsibility for those. We also run between four and six national level events a year in wheelchair rugby, um, wheelchair Aussie rules and lawn bowls mainly. I've summarised this. This is, We have 2.8 full-time equivalent staff. We receive a tiny amount of funding from the federal government and none of that is for our sport program. So everything we do, we have to find partnerships or funding to be able to do. We don't get one single cent for wheelchair rugby, um, despite the fact that we run the entire sport apart from the national team. So basically, it's a role that's growing and we are involved with advocacy, federal government, with corporations, with... Um, the NDIS with a whole bunch of other organisations, um, certification and development of officials in a range of sports, information through our website, social media and a range of others. And if we get time at the end, I'll just quickly show you some of those things on our website. Um, expertise, what, because of our expert experience in disability sport and that of our state organisations, one of the things that we find really powerful is that uh, an able-bodied sporting organisation may be really keen to provide opportunities for people with a disability but don't know how and it's sometimes too hard. You know, they get this great idea but it's just too hard to do it. We may not have that sporting expertise in that particular sport but we've got through our partnerships and our experience and our members that disability knowledge and that passion for people with a disability. So we love to work in partnership to bring that experience to solve the problem and be that solution and allow those things to happen member protection, anti-doping and all of that. We're involved quite actively in research and education. We've developed a, um, a, 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 an education program, a workshop for physiotherapists about disability sport, which we're looking at running down here in Victoria in partnership with uh, Disability Sport and Rec, our Victoria member organisation. Um, we are developing, we've got a research project looking at what are the benefits based on research of sports for people with a physical disability and so on. 
Uh, we run a few different sports camps, including training camps for the guys that just went to the Invictus Games. Um, we delivered there to preparatory training camps and we'll be acting more and more in that capacity again. <laughs> and we run a bunch of different things um, with different sporting organisations. Uh, this page here is a bit generic and you don't need all of it, but this bit here is the important thing. We have um, a member organisation in every state. We're a federated model, sadly, in some ways. Um, each of our member organisations, they existed before we did, which is why we have a federated model, and each of them are quite different from each other, um, and they, but they are the ones that are providing the services on the ground, getting people with a disability involved from a grassroots level um, and streaming them in through different things. So, for the example, um, in New South Wales, because that's where I live, um, Wiltshire Sports New South Wales, when someone comes through the spinal unit at, um, say, Prince Henry um, Hospital, Prince of Wales now, sorry, Hospital and um, Royal Rehab, before they even leave the spinal unit, they're a member of Wheelchair Sports New South Wales. Um, and I know that um, Disability Sport and Rec are doing similar things down here. And the great thing is, is that once someone then goes home, they've already got that link through sport. They then get to try a whole range of different sports. Um, they have loan chairs, they have um, some funding programs, they have a whole bunch of things. And then eventually when someone finds the area that they have expertise in or are passionate about, they then stream into that sport. And that's the sort of general way that it tends to work. Um, we also have an MOU um, with the Australian Rugby Union. Um, it hasn't played... Oh, that was not what I meant to do. Okay, mm. happy days. Um, uh, AFL, that's not been publicly announced yet, but um, we've got a partnership with the AFL um, around our wheelchair Aussie rules, um, and we work in partnership with a lot of others. For me, the, the really important thing about that is that, um, as I said, we're tiny, we're 2.8 full-time equivalent, um, but what we see is there's a real opportunity to, to partner to develop things. So taking this adaptive mountain bike thing as an example um, and how I think this could work. Um, I'll give you the example of wheelchair rugby and I'll give you an example of what we've done in Aussie Rules as, as an example and I think this will be a third different type. Wheelchair rugby, where the governing body, we always have been the governing body. Um, the Australian Paralympic Committee runs the national team at the moment. Um, but because we're small and we don't have a big media team, Michaela is our entire marketing and comms department and she's amazing. <laughs> uh, we don't have a media team and a sponsorship team and a promotions team and an events team and, and all of those things. It's just the 2.8 of us that do that. So with the, our partnership with the Australian Rugby Union, they're supporting us with their expertise in coach development and accreditation, with access to media and social media and PR and potentially sponsorship and so on. So our partnership in that sense, they don't want to take over the sport. Wheelchair rugby is played on a basketball court with a volleyball and there's some kind of mad hybrid between handball and ice hockey and, and you know, a bunch of other things, basketball. Um, and yet culturally it's rugby and, we're, and the Australian Rugby Union love it to be part of the family, but they don't want to take over the sport. Um, they want us to run it, but they want to support it. So that's one partnership that we have. Um, AFL Wheelchair Aussie Rules we developed in partnership with the Australian Defence Force. Um, and we are the, we're the controlling body of that. Um, but our relationship with the AFL, um, they will be more involved than the ARU because it's still based on AFL <coughs> rules. It's played with an AFL ball, even though it's played on a basketball court. So in that case, what we will work on with them is some of the same stuff as we're doing with the ARU. Um, but eventually they may well take over wheelchair Aussie rules, depending, because it is still their sport. So that's, that's something that's flexible. In this case, um, we've got a bunch of different people doing things in different areas, um, in isolation from each other and are starting to find each other. And Andrew, who I think everyone would have to agree, is an, an inspiration in how incredibly professionally he's doing what he's doing. If anyone's looked at his website and the way that he's put together the information, the degree of professionalism with the way that he's approached his trail rating systems, his the presentation about equipment, it's just incredible. Um, it makes it very easy for us as a national body to say, look, we, we haven't got funding that we can put into it at the moment, but we can support it in a range of ways. As a national body, we have a member organisation in every state. So what Andrew and I have talked about is, as he does his tour next year, what we'd like to do is, um, like we've done here with Disability Sport and Rec, is to partner with our state organisation. So if he's in New South Wales, partner with Wheelchair Sports New South Wales, plus any of the local community organisations that are already doing stuff, and then put on one of these sessions or a come and try session. We've got the opportunity, I suppose, we do as to, to bring together that, that that coalition of people and provide that maybe central point at the moment. 
But then you've got um, Mountain Bike Australia who it's their sport. Mountain bike is their sport and this is mountain biking. So in um, our early conversations, what I said to Andrew was, look, we can take a role and certainly we can promote, we can signpost, we can pull together coalitions of people. But if Mountain Bike Australia are willing to take a lead or work in partnership with us, it's their sport. So that's that's a really important thing and had a bit of a chat to Denise in the break about how that might start to look. So um, I guess that, that that's where we come in, um, is passionately supporting um, diversifying the options for people with a disability, bringing together our state organisations and working in partnership to provide, um, I suppose, a, a national focus and help roll things out in different states as we go through. Um, Michaela, do you think we might just be able to quickly have a look at our website just for one minute, just so that for those of you that um, what we want to do on our website, and we haven't, um, we've just launched our new website earlier this year, um, we have sports information um, up there about four sports at the moment, but we're, we're busily uploading it for about another um, 25 sports, and we've already met, um, Andrew and I are working on all the background information for Adaptive Mountain Bike, so that you'll be able to then go onto our website, look under sport and find Adaptive Mountain Bike, and you'll find a whole bunch of information about, uh, this is it here, um, so be able to click on sports or here. Um, and at the moment, um, it's just got, let me just show here, we've just got those listed because we've just been flat chat with events in the first half of this year. But you'll be able to look up Adaptive Mountain Bike. And if we can just click on maybe wheelchair rugby as the example, um, you'll be able to then see an introduction to the sport, a whole bunch of photographs. Can you scroll down? A um, bit about how you play, a bit about the rules, um, who, who's eligible. Um, in this case, because it's a Paralympic sport, there's a bunch on classification. Um, really quickly talk about that. Uh, sorry, that's all. Um, and then how do I get involved? Um, and so what we would want to do with Adaptive Mountain Bike, for example, is list in each state who are the main contacts. So that's something that would be really great. We also have an event page. Oh, oh my. Sorry for everyone who's watching the live screen. You did <laughs> not need to see me and in that bigger relief. <laughs> It also lists for each board any upcoming events that are relevant to it. And then we also have an events section um, as well. Um, so if you have an event that you're running for Adaptive Mountain Bike or any other sport for that matter, you can go on and register your event as well um, and then that will appear when people search for that um, as well. So you can do that. Um, we'll also start to include things on Adaptive Mountain Bike in our newsletter. So you can register to receive our newsletter and you can also like us on Facebook as well. So there's a range of different ways that... Oh, look, what's this? <laughs> yeah. And in terms of the idea that you had, Andrew, about getting together a, a group from each state, we with each of our sports we have a reference group with a state rep. It's how we tend to work. We have a, a core group of people that are driving the development of the sport and then a reference group. So if it makes sense um, for us to provide that coordination in the short term because we do have those states, that's something we'd be happy to do um, and we'd be happy to, to host those phone conferences or whatever else and cover the cost of those. That, that's fine and we'll obviously work in partnership with our states and with you guys to, to roll the sport out. So, yeah, that, that's us and I guess we're really excited to be part of this and uh, to support such a great initiative. Thank you. I'm sorry, live streamers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was excellent. Very good things there. Um, I think with uh, in terms of registering events, I think uh, a lot of the states in MTBA have also have something established, so maybe that's a good area we can work in. Uh, increases the range of um, people out there in, in terms of membership base. Um, and yeah, looking forward to working with the state organisations on this tour next year. I think that's probably one of the key ways of getting people involved and in at least aware that the sport is uh, developing at a very rapid uh, pace. Uh, who do we have next? Julia, I believe it is. Um, yes, yes uh, Julia Pickwick is Acting uh, Access and Inclusion Coordinator from Parks Victoria. Parks Victoria is, is a statutory authority created by <coughs> Parks Victoria Act uh, 1988 and is responsible for managing uh, an expanding and diverse estate covering more than 9 million hectares or about 17% of Victoria. Parks Victoria works in partnership with other government and non-government organisations and community groups such as Department of Environment, Land, Water, Water and Planning, Catchment Management Authorities, Park Landowners, the list goes on. <laughs> so um, yeah, please uh, help me welcome uh, Julie on board. Julie, do you have a presentation at all? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on yeah. the. It's in a folder. I'll put it on. Oh, five. Gotcha. Yeah. And your hands on your pockets. That's it. Sorry. Oh, okay, so thank you for that wonderful introduction and you've saved me a couple of minutes in my presentation <laughs> because you've already covered a lot of the, the, the information. I'm coming for, I guess I'm coming from a slightly different angle with um, my presentation. I just wanted to talk to you about the organisation as a whole for Parks Victoria because a couple of years ago I was managing some small grants that were designed to introduce people to our parks and get people actively involved in our parks and about a third of the applications we got for these small grants were for any parks. And so people assumed that Parks Victoria meant any park in Victoria, not just the ones that we manage. And we manage quite a diverse estate as well. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different things that we do manage, and then I'm going to talk about the different initiatives that Parks Victoria has actually introduced over the years to actually increase accessibility for everyone. I just wanted to start though just with that healthy parks, healthy people because it is the Parks Victoria philosophy and Parks Victoria understands that actually connecting with the outdoors, connecting with the natural environment, how important that is, not just for your physical well-being but also for your emotional and your spiritual and your mental well-being as well. So it's a really, really important thing for us and this is why we're working really hard to get as many people as possible actively involved in our parks. So this is a map of Victoria. All the green and the blue on this map represents the Parks Victoria stuff, which is everything that we manage. People think, and it is a little, it's not the most brilliant map, but just to give you an idea of our estate, and I'll, and I'll talk about these parks as I flip through these slides, because we're not just about national parks, but we do manage some pretty spectacular places. And depending on the sort of asset that we're managing, we're actually governed by a whole lot of different legislation. We've got things like the National Parks Act, we've got the Crown Land Act, we've got the Catchment and Land Protection Act. So there's a whole lot of different layers of legislation that tell us how we actually manage all these different environments. With our marine national parks, back in 2002, Parks Victoria became the first place in the whole world to actually establish marine national parks, because what a lot of people don't realise is that down here in Victoria, the biodiversity in our coastal regions is higher than the Great Barrier Reef, and nine out of ten marine species down here are found nowhere else in the world. So our marine environments are just incredible, which is why we've established these marine national parks. We have wilderness areas as well. If anyone ever gets an opportunity to get out to Big Desert, out in northwestern Victoria, it's absolutely spectacular. And in Victoria, we're really lucky because for such a tiny, tiny little state, we have such a diverse range of scenery. We have some of the best surf beaches in the world. We've got the snow, we've got the desert country, we've got box iron bark forests, all sorts of different rural environments, but we also have areas that we manage in metropolitan Melbourne as well. We have our regional parks, reservoir parks, we manage quite a few of those as well. We also have, we manage over 11,000 Indigenous heritage sites as well. And then there's the non-Indigenous historic sites that we manage as well. And these include historic homesteads and places like that as well. William Rickett Sanctuary is beautiful for those of you who come from the interstate, if you get a chance to get out there. Mm. Up in the Dandenongs, it's a day trip from here and it's absolutely beautiful. We also manage our bays and our piers and our waterways <coughs> as well, including the Yarra River. So it's a really, really big, really diverse amount of assets and parts that we manage. And so what we've been trying to do to fit in with the healthy parts, healthy people is, and it's been through a lot of consultation over the years with various disability advocacy groups and individuals with disabilities and carers with disabilities. So what we've really tried to do is work on different ways that we can actually increase accessibility to everybody in our parks. One of the major ones we've been working on is our all-terrain wheelchairs. 
This gentleman here is a wonderful man called David Stratton. I don't know if many of you have come across him, and he, he was actually interviewed on Radio National the other, uh, the other night about his adventures and our trail rider wheelchairs. And he actually refers to it because he used to be a really keen bushwalker. He now refers to his adventures going off into our parks as bush wheeling, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. This is an all-terrain wheelchair, and David introduced us to the concept of all-terrain wheelchairs after he'd come back from a trip in Canada, and he approached Parks Victoria staff in the Grampians National Park, and so we purchased our first trail rider wheelchair. This is not a self-propelled chair. You need a minimum of two people, one at the front and one at the back. I do have one set up in the foyer that you can have a look at at lunchtime. And we actually call these people Sherpas. Up in the Grampians, we actually have a Sherpa volunteer program. So there's a whole lot of volunteers. So if somebody calls up and they want to use one of the trail riders and they don't have a team of people themselves, we can organise a team of volunteers who can take them out into our parks. This is a group of people. These are actually Parks Victoria staff. And with this all-terrain wheelchair, we became, the Parks Victoria and David Stratton, another gentleman, became the first people in the whole world to actually complete the Oxfam trail walk, the 100 kilometre trail walk. The first wheelchair users that were able to complete that walk, and we had four teams of four Sherpas that helped them complete that walk. This is one of the training sessions, and you can see the chappie at the front here. There's actually a little cord that can help pull that chair as well. Normally, we suggest having one person at the front and one person at the back, and this is the finish line. So this was a world first for us, which was fantastic. We also have our smaller hippocampi all-terrain wheelchairs, and just to let you know, all this equipment is available to use free of charge. I do have brochures over here that you can grab later that show you where this equipment is stored. For example, if you wanted to, to if you're somewhere up near the Grampians National Park in northwestern Victoria, you don't have to specifically visit the Grampians to use one of these chairs. These are just the places where we store them, where you can call up and you can book them. We've also recently introduced a motorised all-terrain wheelchair as well, which isn't designed so that the chair self-propels itself through really, really rugged terrain. It's more designed for when you're actually going up some particularly steep sections of tracks. It's just to assist the Sherpas getting those chairs up those really steep slopes. We also have the Hippocampi all-terrain chairs, and I've got one of those outside as well. These are designed more for children and adults up to 80 kilos. The main reason being, you'll notice on the one outside, they're quite low to the ground, so it's more a loading issue if anyone's larger than 80 kilos. These ones you can actually take into the water as well, which is absolutely fantastic. So what we're doing with this equipment, as you can see from the expression on her face, little Leslie's face, is that we're providing opportunities for people to actually do things that they wouldn't normally have the chance to do. With our beach wheelchairs, like this one here, this is the Lash Yourself Prepare Propel Beach oh. Wheelchair that we introduced earlier this year. And while these beach wheelchairs can actually get taken into the ocean, we don't recommend going in too deep because they do float. So we certainly don't want users floating away and then having a having lifeguard going out to rescue them, but it certainly means that you can actually be a lot more independent in our parks. And in terms of working out where this equipment actually goes, we actually had to have a look at the accessibility options for people to actually get to these parks in the first place. So look at car parking, look at the tracks that are going down to beaches, and also look at accessible toilets as well. So this is another one of our beach wheelchairs as well. And as I said before, these are all available to use for free. Is that we info also, on your sorry, is that info on your website? About yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We also introduced for the first time a stair climber wheelchair at Buckin Caves, which is one of our beautiful cave reserves out in East Gippsland. And this basically works on a similar um, basis to the to the stair trolleys that removalists use, and so it means that we can now again get children and adults up to 80 kilos down through stairs so that they can actually get to view our caves and our subterrane environments for the first time, which is absolutely wonderful. We also provide park access information. If you go to our website, we've got an accessibility and inclusion in parks page. What we've also started doing is <coughs> accessing the facilities at our individual parks. Obviously, because we manage so much, we can't get it all done at once, and so we've prioritised it 
on visitation. So if you go to some of the Parks Victoria individual web pages, like the Dandenong Ranges National Park, Grampians National Park, or some Promontory National Park, some of our urban parks as well, like Karkarook Park, Westerfolds Park, there is an accessibility tab on the left-hand side of the page, and it will actually show you photos of the accessibility services that we provide in those individual parks. What we're also just starting to work on now is virtual tours of parks as well. So I don't know when we're actually going to be launching that, but it just means that if you want to check out a park, you can actually go to Google Maps and you can check it out. You can check out all the facilities first so that you can figure out if that's an appropriate place for you to visit. We also have our accessibility and evaluation manual, and so this is available to staff, and I've had a couple of calls just recently where staff are updating their park information, and they want to make sure that the information is correct. So this actually provides all the legal standards for access to toilets and pathways, etc., etc., to make sure that we're meeting the national standards for accessibility in our parks. We also have accessible accommodation at Wilson's Promontory National Park and Cape Conrad National Coastal Park. This is an eco cabin down at Wilson's Prom. And one of the things that happened down at Wilson's Promontory National Park was about five years ago we had a major flood down there, and so the whole of the tidal river campground flooded. And we had up to two metres of water in the campground down there, so it was a perfect opportunity because everything got damaged by floodwaters to actually refurbish our accommodation. So in our eco cabins down at Wilson Promontory National Park, we have high low beds and we have all sorts of other equipment for people with disabilities with who are very high needs or those with very low needs so that they can actually come and access our parks. We have wilderness retreats that are fully accessible and so these are for people who are really into their glamping, who really want to have that luxury camping experience, so these are all abilities accessible. So they're quite neat, these, um, these wilderness retreats. So these are at Wilson's Promontory National Park and at Cape Conran Coastal Park. Visitor centres, again, because of the flood that we had down at Wilson's Promontory National Park, it was a perfect opportunity for us to actually refurbish our visitor centre to make that more accessible for everybody. We have also put in more boardwalks as well, again at Wilson Promontory National Park, because we had the boardwalk that went through the wetlands on Tidal River down there, it was a perfect opportunity to actually put in all abilities accessible fishing platforms and also make sure that all the signage that we had along that fishing platform as well was actually at a level where you could read it from the wheelchair rather than having to crane your neck up to actually look at all the signage <coughs> as well. And so we've got all our boardwalks in our parks. We have viewing platforms that are all ability viewing platforms so that there are people are actually able to get out and have a look at some of the stunning scenery that we have in our parks in Victoria. We've just a new one that we're starting is canoe launches. This is at um, Kings Billabong up near Mildura and we're just about to launch one down at Patterson River as well, down in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. And another one that we're currently working on introducing is swing lifts. And so because recreational fishing is, is so popular, what we're looking into is, is getting a swing lift design so that we can actually lift wheelchairs from the riverbanks onto boats so that people can actually go out and do go fishing as well. So there's a lot of initiatives. It's also our park infrastructure as well. And just wanted to touch on, um, in terms of actually meeting people, people who are really interested in visiting our parks, and the chappie down the back, sorry, I didn't catch your name, was actually talking about accessing our parks because we have all our lock management gates and things. And probably the best thing to do is contact our 13 19 63 phone number and ask to get put through to the park. And then you can organise to actually get a key most parks will actually sign in, sign out, and you put down a $50 deposit or whatever you for your key, you get it back when you return your key, which means that you'll be able to access those parks. From someone who's worked out at Wilson's Prom and has also worked in the Dandenong Ranges National Park, and the Dandenong Ranges National Park visitation there is about 3.5 million people a year, so very small park, lots and lots of people there. So part of the reason why we have this locked gate policy is to keep people safe. <laughs> 
about 90% of what we do, both at Wilson's Promontory National Park and at Daniel and Wages National Park, is managing people. And it's making sure, primarily making sure that people are safe. And so actually calling up and letting park staff know, getting to know the park staff as well, is a really, really good idea if you want to start accessing our parks. And it also means that we know where you are <laughs> if something happens. Campbell was talking about his overnight hike down at Wilson's Prom. And one of the things that we have in place with overnight hikes in our parks is a booking system and a permit system. And the reason why we have that, and again going back to the flood that we had at Wilson's Promontory, because we had a, the main road, the bridge got washed out in the main road, people couldn't drive out. And so, and we had people at all our remote um, overnight camping spots as well. And so we had to evacuate over 250 people by helicopter. And it ended up being one of the biggest air evacuations in Australia's history when we get when we're getting people out of the problem and so and we ended up I think about 120 people who were at our outstations and because we had the booking system we knew exactly who was in at all those different locations and so when helicopters were going in to do the rescues we knew exactly how many people had to get picked up from each spot and I'm not suggesting that <laughs> you're going to have to contend with something like that every time you go to one of our parks but this is why we have these processes in place is to keep is to keep you safe and make sure that we know where people are. We do have a couple of guys that turned up for an overnight hike that they booked, but they booked up, they rocked up at 11 o'clock on a 38 degree day with two litres of water each, and they wanted to do a 40 kilometre hike. And because you actually have to pick up your hiking permit before you go, we could actually say, look, really not a good idea because you've left it so late in the day to do a 40k hike. 20k height when you've got two litres of water. And so we had to help them modify their plan. So really a lot of how we manage our parks is people management and it's about keeping people safe. We also have, just the last one, because I'm, I'm a big kid myself, we also have these fantastic all abilities accessible playgrounds as well. And this one here, Brimbank Park, which is in northwest of Melbourne, about 15 k's from the city centre. This is actually designed for all abilities. So, so there's all sorts of stuff in here for children and people who are vision impaired and also um, hearing impaired as well as mobility impaired as well. Okay. So this is what Parks Victoria has, has been working on and we would love to have more people coming into our parks and organising events. I have brought some information about organising and planning events and that's why I talked to you about the range and parks and assets that we manage because depending on where you actually want to run your event will certainly depend, well, that's what will happen when you put a new event application. One, if you do want to hold events in our parks, do your research first, get in contact with the local park staff because they'll be able to give you the best advice on the best tracks to use in that particular park, get maps, work out your routes, all that sort of stuff before you put in your event application because it takes about eight weeks for your application to be processed. So there's information there about the event application process. There's also forms so that you know what the application form is all about. There's also a flyer about where all our accessibility equipment is and it is all free to use. And I just wanted to finish on a really lovely story of... Um, a dear friend of mine who had advanced MS and she had spent a lot of her life monitoring malleafowl up in northwestern Victoria, an endangered bird, and as her MS advanced she became more and more mobility impaired and she ended up being a wheelchair user. We got the, our first trail rider up in the Grampians National Park about six months after she started using a wheelchair for a time <coughs> and so we were actually able to take her out into her Mali country and when we got her back out there she was in tears and she's saying I never thought I'd ever be able to access my Mali country again and she passed away about three months after that but because of our trail rider we were actually able to take mm. her back into the country that she really loved. So that's Parks Victoria. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. That was, well, that was mind-blowing, a lot of that stuff. Um, 
Yeah, things like the uh, Sherpa volunteer program, great to have you know some a structured program there for people that need assistance. I know when you know I go out on some of my bigger rides, so it, it's good to have a support person there with me, and it's sort of all ad hoc at this point. But it's great to see something established, and I can see that expanding for people who want to use cycles and things like that. Uh, accessible accommodation. I don't need to say anything about that. It's the best I've seen in Australia so far. Um, things like me going to Cape to Cape, where you're out there for a few days at a time, you know, four days. You want to go out there and explore the wilderness as well, and you need the right accommodation for that. It makes it a lot more comfortable, a lot more pleasant. And to see, you know, some of these hot spots, some of these major national parks where you, everything else is accessible as well, so that you finish your riding one day, next day you can go check out one broad, broad walk, so do some sightseeing or whatever. It's great to see that, and I think it's nice to have more of these little hot spots that people can go and explore. So. No, that's some great work that you've done there. Well done. Um, we'll introduce our last guest speaker. Uh, we've had to cancel the speaker afterwards. He couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, so we've given uh, Bill a bit more time. He gives us a bit more time for the uh, for the panel questions. Um, Bill Forrester is the co-founder of Trappability, which was formed in 2007 uh, with Deborah Davis to develop accessible information on tourist destinations to help travellers with disability plan their dream holiday. In recent years, they have become strong advocates for both government and the tourist industry to improve their facilities, training and information services for people with disability. And just having a conversation with Bill the other day, he's got a wealth of knowledge and has been working with Vic um, Parks Victoria and a lot of other groups as well. So um, please welcome uh, Bill. Thanks for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here, and it's. I love to see more inclusive activities that aren't just with all due difference to the wheelchair basketballers. Wheelchair basketball. <laughs> 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 Your feet. You feature. Sure, sure. Just quickly, a little bit about us. We are all about creating new opportunities, new experiences that are out there. Before I actually put this presentation together, I thought, how am I going to actually upstage Campbell? Because I knew what he was going to do. I think I probably have, and it's just a pity that Ruth and Emma aren't still here. Because this will be your next trip. <laughs> so I'm just going to spend five minutes, because we are at the end of the day, and I think it's probably due for a bit of a bit of excitement. <laughs> now, why did I show you that? Apart from waking you up for the last session of the day, John Kenwright from Parks Victoria, who Linda is acting for at the moment, is, and I had the pleasure of presenting with Christian Bag at Destinations for All in Montreal at the end of 2014. Christian is John Kenwright's equivalent in Parks Alberta. He is the access and inclusion person. That's their definition of, I guess, off-road mountain biking without the wheels. The important thing about that is Christian and a fellow by the name of Don Carruthers Den Hoad are probably the world leaders in accessible outdoor initiatives. Parks Alberta have a fantastic vision statement and it simply says everyone belongs outside. They've embraced that, and in fact, in terms of how it comes back to affecting this group, Christian Bag and Don Carruthers are currently working on plans for an off-road mountain bike. Two versions, one with power assist and amps for upright, and one pure gravity. When those plans are finished, which are being funded by the government of Alberta, they will be in the public domain. So there'll be home handyman constructible, which I think is a great initiative from Parks Alberta to try and bring 
the cost of participation in some of these initiatives right there. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes doing something I wasn't going to do, but I will anyway. Because I think it's important to have this group not only participating in sports, but also become really strong advocates to change perceptions generally. Because I've got my famous ability graph, and I think we all need to really understand this very carefully. When we talk about disability, someone in the medical profession has drawn an arbitrary line down here. When the general public thinks about people with disability, they seem to have a line that is drawn way down here with this sort of perception. Part of the issues in getting the penetration we need through the tourism industry, through National Parks Associations and everything else, is to change that perception. Now let me just go to the other one. We know that we've got what I call a continuum of ability from this level right up to the extreme level. So there is no two people in the world alike. The funny thing about it is the tourism industry in particular is very well adept. I should lose the little... Where's the bottom? Oh, that one. Up here, does anyone know, for instance, how many, what the staff to client ratio is for a climbing expedition in Nepal? And I'm not talking about Everest, I'm just talking about a normal climbing expedition. Depends on the height, at 6,000 metres it's 11 to 1, 7,000 metres is 25 to 1, on Everest it's 40 to 1. So we've got an industry that is very well adept at actually providing really high level support. What it's not putting its mind to is the needs and opportunities that exist within the active disability sector. That's something we need to change. That's something that BSR, something that you, Jenny, have really got to work hard on within the tourism industry. We need to take it away from just being disability support into actually commercialisation. Why is that important? I'm digressing a little bit. These are figures that came out of Visit England. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to labour them like I normally do. A couple of really interesting statistics, though. In the day trip market, which is a lot of parks visitation, all the stuff we're talking about, 20% of the total tourism market in 2014 in England was people with disability and their friends. On the overnight market, it's 14%. And look at the growth between 2009 and 2014. 33% in accessible tourism, only 19% in general tourism. This is a big thing. This is what we need to keep driving and pushing to change the money. I won't go, I won't go that way. And when that happens, what we start to do is get that innovation that people like Christian Bagg are working on, generally. So all the support facilities you need, like toilets, paths, and the rest of it, start becoming second nature because people are starting to cater to the whole thing. Because currently we have a habit of starting here, calling the access auditors at the point where it's too late. To help that, Parks Vic sort of started on it and they underplayed something. To me, this is one of the most important documents that Parks Victoria have produced. We help them write it. This actually is the underlying philosophy that changes some of the culture that led to the trial rider and other things being adopted. You spoke earlier, Andrew, about facilities supporting stuff. This manual pulls together the best practice from around the world. It's not just AS1428. This manual, Parks Victoria are the only people so far to have adopted this sort of philosophy. No other park association has. It's something that I would encourage everybody from every other state to actually try and encourage to do it. And John Kenwright and myself have made this available. It's on the Travelability website under resources as a download. So have a look at it. This, in my view, this isn't the be all and end all. This is the beginning document and we need to keep doing it. We need to harness some of the work that Andrew was talking about, some of the work that National Parks Association are doing on trails, how we bring together trail grading systems for things like the Trail Rider, for mountain bikes, for gravity bikes, and for some of the other power-assisted vehicles like that Swedish four-wheel drive thing that was tested at Falls Creek a couple of weeks ago. We need to bring all of these opportunities together 
and really sought to come up with some form of information system and grading for all sorts of outdoor activities. So how we do that, I don't know yet, but I think we all should start talking. The critical things, obviously, here, we've already spoken about, is all the various supporting facilities, but in particular, the continuous paths of access. No good having a car parking spot. It's no good having a toilet over there. It's no good having a trailhead up there if you've got a chasm between them or soft sand or whatever else. It's bringing all the facilities up to speed to make all of the activities easy and usable. I just want to take a minute to go through some of the stuff that's coming out of We all know about that, and if you don't know the David Stratton story, there is a video, have a look on YouTube and look up Wild Places. You'll need a box of tissues, I can tell you. It's a, it is a tear-jerking story, but it is a fabulous five-minute video. It's called Wild Places. It'll be on the Parks Victoria tab on YouTube. So the trail riders won. That's a non-active. Canoeing is becoming really big in America and in that. There is a plethora now of cheap add-ons and cheap back supports to make canoeing really, really accessible. We've already seen the self-propelled wheelchairs, which give another level of independence. That is the Wilson's Promontory chair. From That was from the inaugural Giant Odyssey, wasn't it, that one? It was, yes. <laughs> Do you feature that one? I think you were. You were too far in front. You're too far in front. Another great, another really good one for the sporting bodies around here. I love this sport. It started in America five years ago with five guys. It's now up to a national competition of 5,000 people. The beauty of it here, this was actually done down at... Um, they call that thing the YMCA place on the area? River Slide. Yeah, down at River Slide. The beauty of this one is it's an inclusive sport. So you'll get the guys in the chairs, you'll get people on their skateboards, and you get the people on the scooters all shredding together. It is it's not separating people. And this is a this is one that we really should be promoting as a sport in Australia, to get the young people really engrossed and involved and active. That one's been around for a while, but that's we've had um, we had four guys, I think, this year went to California. They did very well in the world. Fastest growing sport in America outside that is now the adaptive rock climbing. This one's obviously taken in a gym, but the number of equipment that's now available. What we need, of course, is more outfitters to start buying this sort of equipment in places like the Grampians to actually start running this sort of program. How can we help in all this? I guess a lot of people don't know. We've, I've made a mistake, I think, in the past of being a very good advocate for inclusive tourism without actually selling the fact that we are Australia's premier travel agents for people with a disability. We've got a skill set, really, that I don't think can be matched today. I've been at this for 10 or so years. So we can do everything from equipment hire, flights, accommodation, we have a network probably second to none without sort of sound like I'm bragging. Our destinations might surprise you. Now, obviously, we do the USA and Canada, you, everybody would. Mexico is surprisingly accessible. Some of the old ruins. The UK is probably the world leader in accessible tourism per se. But you've got places like the Catalonia region of Spain that have made it a national priority to become accessible. And you can do any sort of activity there, from sailing, sit skiing, anything. Israel and Jordan, believe it or not. Africa. Now, does everyone know about Indaba? Indaba is the National Tourism Conference. You get 16,000 people turn up at Indaba every year. They've now got a separate wing in their tourism suppliers conference that is purely for accessibility. So you can go on safari in Botswana, you can go on safari in Kruger, or on the Shislui. You've got diving in Mozambique, and I'm thinking of next slide. 
Um, Cambodia, Costa Rica, Ecuador. You can do Amazon, you can do the Galactics. And New Zealand is starting to get into see more adventurous activities. Wheelchair punji jumping. The little video that's running at the moment is probably the hardest trip we ever did. That's Anthony Bartel. He's a C1 ventilated quad. We sent him to Africa on safari for 15 days. Now, if we can do that, I think we can probably do just about anything. That took 18 months in the planning, so don't come to me tomorrow and say, I won't. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, Clearly, when it comes to the mountain biking, there are some fabulous gravity and mountain biking opportunities. Whistler is way up there in terms of its opportunities, both for gravity and for trials. Closely followed by a steamboat. And if you want to really get out of the Arches National Park, Moab in Utah is a centre of excellence again for off-road mountain biking. Clearly, snow skiing, there's some great adaptive programs. Steamboat is, is one of the best. Whistler. Is so if you want to get off the beaten track, there's a little place in Canada called um, Snow Peaks, Sun Peaks, which is right in the middle, halfway between the Rockies and the, and the coastal range. Got one of the best adaptive programs in the world, one of the most user friendly adaptive villages you'll <coughs> ever see. There's even an important thing is a wheelchair lift in the bottle shop. Forgot <laughs> 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 the priority right now. <laughs> Oh, no, um, Sun Peaks is a fabulous spot. Um, some unusual places. This is some of the best diving in the world off Mozambique. Fully accessible diving resort that goes and goes out with the coral and the whales. Um, climbing all over North America. I've already talked about safari. For those who remember, the Lord Nelson was out here in the summer of 2012, 2013. That's the fully adaptive tall ship. Its sister ship, which was built 15 years later and is about 15 metres longer and is better equipped, tenacious, arrives in Sydney at the end of August for this year. There are 19,000, 1,900, sorry, berths available for the sailing program that varies from one day sails right through to, I think the longest is a 23 day sail. That's this summer if anyone's interested in a really different experience. I was actually talking to him yesterday about how we how we start promoting them. And some unusual, I've already talked about the Amazon, the Galacticus, but Nepal is now starting to come up with a whole heap of new opportunities. So it's happening in places you may not expect. Whoops. I'm going to give a little plug for myself and all the rest. All the advocacy work we do, everything, because we're not a non, we're not a not for profit. We're not a funded body. We're not anything else. We fund all that ourselves out of our commercial travel operations. What we do do for groups, sporting clubs, associations, all the rest of it, we give ten percent of the commission we make on those trips back to sporting groups if they register, and that's really to encourage clubs to get their sponsors and other people to travel with us as well. Because we're a travel agency. That we make money, we're prepared to give something back to you, and it's an ongoing thing to fund our whole our whole, our own whole operation. In terms of lagging here. In terms of our affiliation, part of the reason we, we have got the network we've got, we belong to two very powerful organisations, ENAT, which is the European Network of Accessible Tourism, and SAF, which is the American Society for Accessible Tourism Hospitality. So by that, we have got networks all over the world to make virtually anything you want to do happen. The final thing I'm going to say is one of the frustrations we had about four years ago is I could go and preach to tourism organisations, I could go and preach to a lot of people about accessible tourism, and there wasn't any imagery. All the imagery people were using were typical hospital chairs, sort of, they're either pity invoking, 
or inspirational, none of which was what I would call true real life thing. For those of you who don't know, we started Photo Ability, and the cards are up the front here, about four years ago. It was the world's first commercial stock image library dedicated to real people with a disability. So you'll find no fake imagery. What we need from you guys, and I know there are certain issues with certain contracts with some Olympic sports and Paralympic sports, but spread the word. Spread the word to your photographers. It's a commercial stock image library. You've got people out there taking pictures. We would love to have them added to the library. So no obligation. Photo ability. Photo ability. We'd love them. Because what that does is gives me more fuel to the fire. It gives the media and other people a chance to actually start presenting disability activities as they really are. Real people doing real things. And I think we'll probably get some real change. And that's it for me. Thanks, Bill. Um, you had a bit of time there to spare as well, but uh, we'll use that with the Q&A panel there. Um, a lot of great stuff there. Um, like the guy said, uh, I forgot the fellow's name, uh, in the video, uh, we all want the same thing, and that's why we're all here today. So let's work on it together. It's that simple. Um, I really like the idea of the self-building of hand cycles. Uh, of course, cost is a really big thing, and uh, me personally, I love building things and seeing final product and actually being able to use it myself. Um, I think that's a really great way of cutting costs down for people and getting more equipment out there and therefore more people riding. Um, yes, and the photo ability idea is great. We really need to change people's perceptions and, and show them what the reality of People with disabilities is, you know, we are not the hospital people and we are not these, we are not all these extreme athletes that do wonderful and amazing things. There's a massive spectrum in between, which is the majority of us. And I think once we do start changing these perceptions, uh, people will, will buy into what it is that we're trying to sell to them.